and welcome. I am so pleased this month to be uh, featuring the work of Tacoma-based artist Audrey Tulumiero welch um, Audrey uh, grew up in Livingston, New Jersey. She earned a BFA from the University of Delaware and then went on to earn an MFA from the Art Institute of Boston at Lesley University. And while she's made Tacoma her home since 2016, for the 15 years prior to that, she spent five years each living in Indonesia, Thailand, and Australia. She has an extremely impressive resume, exhibiting her work for more than 30 years throughout the US, Bangkok, Indonesia, Germany, Singapore, and Australia. And in addition, her work has been included in numerous museum exhibitions, including the Frauen Museum in Germany, Bade Museum in Berkeley, California, the Coos Bay Art Museum here in Oregon, Museo Italo Americano in San Francisco, the Crocker Museum of Art in Sacramento, and the National Museum of Thailand. And just this past spring, her work was included in an exhibition titled The Abstraction Haiku at the Tacoma Art Museum. So I'm so pleased to have her here, so grateful that she made the trip to be with us this morning. Please welcome Audrey Tulumiero Welch. Thank you, Martha, Eric. Um, let's see, we have, uh, I always forget, Katrina and uh, Sunny and Jennifer, a great team to work with, so thank you very much. And I'd like to thank each of you for coming, especially those who have come a bit of a distance. It's so nice to see some familiar faces in the audience, so welcome. I wanted to add just a little bit to that education biography. Um, one of the most uh, influential experiences I had was actually after higher education. I studied for two years at the Art Students League in New York City, and I had a chance to mentor with a Russian painter, Mark Kleonsky, who had a big studio in Soho. And Mark taught in the traditional European way, which meant I was to come, and I was to watch him paint and really not ask too many questions nor talk too much. But the great thing about working with Mark is he showed me um, pretty much like Rembrandt's techniques of doing a lot of underpainting, developing the chiaroscuro of the darks and the lights, and then a lot of glazing. And it was in preparing this talk that I realized that experience in the early 80s has really impacted this, this propensity I have to, to layer and layer and layer. So when I approach painting, I think very much about layering. And I think it's learning those master's techniques um, had, a, had an influence on that. So I'd like to start with just talking uh, generally about some of the basic um, contextual ideas that inform my work, and then speak more specifically to this exhibition, which is titled Fuel. And then hopefully there'll be some good time for some questions. So my abstract layered paintings can be viewed as metaphoric maps that contain in their embedded surfaces personal experience and stories from everyday life. As a result, as Martha had said, of living overseas for 15 years, living and working with my family um, in Indonesia, Thailand, and Australia, I tried at that time to develop a way of working in the studio that could address place. And I began to look at maps of my geographical place as a way to ground me in unfamiliar geographies and customs and codes. So I began to take those maps and get big Xeroxes made of them and then I would transfer them onto the canvas as a first layer. Often the, those maps got obliterated while I kept painting, but it seemed important to have them as a grounding. And if you, when you take a look around at the paintings, um, I still use that process today, and there are maps. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Similar to the way maps navigate geographic place, I also use line, color, and gesture as a way to lead the viewer few sites that are familiar and unknown, personal and universal. In her book, The Contingencies of Mapping, Cecilia Constellation reads maps, and I quote, as a poetic space, a conceptual opening in which possibility exceeds evidence. It is in this space of possibility where stories, impressions, and memories emerge. This slippage between the known and the unknown 
is the possibility that maps call forth. I really resonate with Constellation's image there about this slippage of the known to the unknown. And I find that abstraction calls forth this split, slippage. And I, I want to define what I think slippage means. So for me, it means that unknown, the metaphor, and the spiritual. So abstraction provides the possibility for compelling dichotomies. For example, known, unknown, interior, exterior, spiritual or spirit and matter, hope, despair, concrete and elusive. I realized as a young person that I was as interested in the external world of the here and now as much as the interior world um, and the spiritual life. Growing up on the East Coast in a suburb of New Jersey, I'm nostalgic about a particular childhood landscape. And over the years, I've gone back to that landscape and have photographed it. And there's a particular kind of uh, looping vine that grows around the trees that are typically quite vertical. And this juxtaposition of the gesture with the, with the geometric edge, really, in a sense, is something that pictorially really interests me. And you'll see it everywhere in my work. And it's not a new idea. It really comes from art history. It comes from the tenets of abstract expressionism. And it's, it, that's a movement and a moment in art history that had a great influence on my work and sensibility. Line is also dominant in my work. And I feel that's an interesting thing that kind of connects me and Kirk. I don't know where Kirk went to. Uh, but when you look at his work, you know, that, was, that beautiful line that happens um, from the threads of canvas. But in my work, line functions as a mapping structure for place. It makes travel from one place to another and tracks the body in time and space. For me, line is a wayfinder, a way in, out, and around pictorial space. My process is additive in the sense that I paint layer upon layer, but it's also subtractive in the sense that as I mask, and I mask with tape as well as sheets of contact paper that are adhesive where I can cut out form, so part of my process is at the end, it's that subtracting, it's the pulling away. Um, and this adding and subtracting is pretty much going on all throughout the painting session. A word about materials. I work primarily with acrylic, um, but also you'll find graphite, marker, I talked about the tape and the contact paper, but also a secret formula of plaster. And I'm happy to share my, my recipe and my secrets with anyone who might be interested in that plaster layer. But oftentimes, um, it's, this is a good example, when the, the ground is more pale in uh, tone, that's really the, that's the plaster layer that comes towards the end. San Francisco art critic Kenneth Baker accurately described my process when he wrote, Welch's process is constructive, involving the layering of color and the masking or subsequent cutting away of layers, suggesting that she foresees only to a degree a painting's final state. And that's very true. My process is a bit backwards, and I don't know what the end result will be until I've peeled away the layers. Oftentimes, it doesn't work. <laughs> As I experience it, painting, the process of painting is a fluid one. From the known to the unknown, from mapped to unmapped layers, and opens a way for the spirit to arise through those unmapped territories. The process frees the mystery. Mystery unfolds in process. Now I'd like to direct my comments more to, to this exhibition, to these pieces in fuel. So one important source, source um, that generated uh, the idea, the thematic idea that 
goes through this work was a book I was reading at the time by Gregory Boyle called Barking to the Choir. Boyle is a Jesuit priest who's been working 35 years with the gangs in LA. And he has this to say, though not obliterated, our wounds can become their own kind of fuel, their own kind of illumination. That really struck home at the time when I read it. And I knew it spoke to a certain truth that I wanted to try to explore pictorially. The other seed for this exhibition came out of my own day-to-day -day life. While preparing for this show, our family experienced a season of struggle, conflict, and loss. In the studio, I was often reminded of an insight spoken by an artist friend, Brian Rittenberg, who stated that to find meaning one needs to pay attention to suffering. And he believed that artists, in particular, revere suffering. <laughs> Fuel relates to this idea. All of us suffer. All of us carry wounds, an inevit inevitable truth of being human. And yet, as my friend understood, suffering can be the conduit towards meaning and transformation. This selection of paintings I've created for Fuel attempt to speak with a certain fierceness for life, especially when life presents suffering. In canvas after canvas, the paintings seek to forge a dialogue between adversity and the possibility of hope, and how the movement between these dichotomies provides fuel and traction becoming their own kind of illumination, as Boyle stated. There's another source of inspiration in this work, and that's color. Let me get my little. So there's two palettes going on here, and you'll see them here and in the other room. So one is this intense, very saturated coral red color, and with strong contrasts of blacks and whites and golds. Um, and that, that comes from two sources. So I saw this image, um, a friend of mine, maybe some of you know her, uh, the painter Helen O'Leary, but she had a fellowship in Rome and she was posting every day images that she was photographing in Rome and this popped up in her Instagram feed. And when I saw this image, I was so blown away by the palette. That I, but it isn't a palette I've seen for the only time. I've seen this in Australia by my studio, there was a street that had a sidewall of a building that was painted with this gorgeous coral color. And then it had this like fading, warm white gate and some black, and it was, it was this palette, it didn't have the gold. But um, so when I saw this again, I thought, you know, that, that palette's already embedded in my memory. And I wanted to continue to see if I could challenge myself to do um, this palette over a body of work. Um, so that was my intention when I started Fuel. So this color is really speaking to that fiery fierceness about standing in the gap of suffering. And then came the palette, then this painting happened, actually it's the one in the other room came first, and I was, I was um, <laughs> forced to look at another palette, which is much more minimal in color, much cooler and watery. And I realized it really spoke to buoyancy and hope. So that's the two kind of thematic ideas that the color is trying to speak about. <clears throat> so in closing, I wanted to share a story I heard on the radio September 11th last year. It lends insight to what motivates me to paint and relates to the theme of this exhibition fuel. The female voice on the radio was recounting how 18 years ago, on September 11th, ash fell from the sky over Manhattan, the result of burning buildings, planes, and human flesh. Every year on the anniversary, the New York City evening skyline is pierced by a light show with a dozen intense light beams penetrating high into the atmosphere. Due to the powerful light beams, the sky fills with migrating birds and insects. Scientists have been tracking this yearly phenomenon 
and record staggering numbers of up to 200,000 birds. And the voice on the radio said, and they are all intensely alive. Where there was once ash, now there's light, birdsong and life. And then she ended with, quote, if this reality does not transform, what can? I sat in the car for a long while. The story stirred my imagination. My mind wanted to grasp what I just heard. The truth that embedded within unfathomable evil, hatred and suffering, there can emerge an outpouring of birdsong and light. These are hard times. Often it feels counter-cultural to walk into the studio and to paint. But I also believe that now more than ever, we need makers of beauty. Although I can't put words to logically tell you how this happens, and I know many of you sitting here have experienced it, but painting can and does transform ash into birdsong, suffering into fuel. This is the highest reason I know to pursue painting. Works of art can empower us with the rage to live. And it's my hope that my paintings in this exhibition can do just that for you, the viewer. Thank you. So your questions next, but before um, we do, I just wanted to point out there are catalogs. They're not the most current one, if this is a show I had in 2011, but they're available in the back. Just take one if you'd like. So, any questions? Yeah. Audrey, I'm, I'm just uh, really interested in what you had to say about the maps and the location and the slippage and the and leading you to a place. and. Um, and since I've known you for a while, I've known you lived in far flung places that often take super long plane rides mm. to get there. Um, you made me start reading these in a different way with the long, the, the, the sort of, you have long marks that are straighter and then the clusters. And I'm starting to think of them as where you land and you make a home and you hmm. make connections. Hmm versus the distance to get there. And I, and I know, I mean, it's been a life that, where do you live? <laughs> you know? No, where are you from? Where are you know. from? And, and I just wondered if you could maybe speak to that. I mean, even if some of these long marks are like the plane rides or, you know, how you think of, of I guess, the, the straightaways versus the clusters. Mm -hmm. It, it's an interesting question, and I, I think because I've been working, oh, and I wanted to say this too, and I, then I'll address that. Abstraction wasn't, wasn't my first place, wasn't my first choice. My training was so classical that I was painting portraits and landscape and still lives, and that was going on for about 10 years. And then I, I became not so interested in all that, but more in the space around it. So I got rid of all the content and just started doing the space. But I think because I've been working now in abstraction since the late 80s for so long, that I, I don't, I think much more just about the mark. And, um, and, I, and I was excited about this work too, because I'm able to allow that intuitive mark, which comes very much to, from even before abstract expressionism to the surrealists who were doing the, you know, the blind drawing or the, um, there was another word for it, I think. Um, but that intuitive mark, where you almost even have to close your eyes and just let yourself, your body make the mark. And that, I hadn't been doing that for a while. And that seems to be really um, necessary to do. Um, and I wanted to try to find a way, how can I keep the drawing somewhat <laughs> fresh, but still have them be about paint as well, <laughs> and trying to bring those two things together. Um, but I like that idea. I, I don't. I haven't consciously thought about well the long plane ride and then the you know the moving you know. But you know maybe that's in the body. You know maybe that's 
happening. And um, you should write that down for me. (laughs) (laughs) Just a follow-up question, because I I know uh, you have this great Thailand mop or Australian mop. Oh, the mop, yeah, the mop. Because it, it also has that gestural long versus, you know, clustered or, you know. But it's different than the tape mark and yes yes you know does it come later or right you know yeah that's a good question and I did forget to say that so um in the, the way I put paint down is I very rarely work vertically because I'm working pretty wet and I, and I don't want everything dripping, right? So I'm, I've got a table or that I'm on the floor, but um, there's a sweeping mark. So this big sweeping mark. So there's a, my favorite mop from Thailand. I, took, I brought it with me and I use that um, when I'm working. It's a really thin um, ink is what it is just really thin down and um, but sometimes I just want that big sweeping mark um, and yeah in contrast to you know the hard edge that the tape provides and again it's that curve of the looping vine and the straight tree you know harks back to that to that landscape and the tenets of art history yeah yeah so that intrigued me a little bit so the swooping mark and the mop and stuff so you consciously, you know, you're, you're viewing the status of the painting wherever you are and mm-hmm. along you go, hmm, I think that needs a big swooping mark, where's my mop? Or you just find yourself drifting to grab the mop and, mm-hmm. and just do it. That's a good question, too. So I've been doing this for a while. <laughs> And um, what, I, what I started doing, because you're right, I, I, like a painting would finish and I'd look at it and go, how the heck did I do that? And I realized what I needed to do is take notes, you know, so I, and, and especially this isn't uncommon, but when you mix a color, right, you often you want to know how did I mix that color? So you'll write down that little formula, right? So what I started doing very consciously is I started photographing um, my, my layers, you know, as I, as I go along and I've, I've got a big book and, um, each painting I start and then I put the, the photographs in of the process and, um, it's like an, a recipe. I write the layers down, you know, so say transfer collage, um, gestural painting, um, masking, contact paper, more paint, you know, and I, and I write down my layers of the, on the painting so that I, so that I, it's, it's like a map to me. I realized I need to do this. I need to write this down because it's another mapping. Um, I sound like a real control freak, but, (laughs) but, um, but because there is an intuitive part to the work and you're right, because you paint over a long, um, a lot of years, you begin to have a conversation with the painting, with a relationship. And yeah, it does tell you sometimes, stop. Or it tells you, yeah, you know, you need to get a watery mark here, or this needs higher saturation. Or So yeah, the painting does speak to you. Um, but it's also really helpful to have this reference that I can go, I can set a painting out and go, okay, I'm going to, the way I like to do it is I like to start a painting having very strict parameters. I'm going to use these colors. I'm going to use these layers. Now, I don't always go to plan. <laughs> the plan can be loose and intuitive, but it's really helpful for me how I start a painting is to have a mapped out way of going. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Does that answer your question? It did, um, after the swoop, did you plan the swoop? Then I'm... <laughs> right? So the swoop, if I write down mop, well, then I know the mop is going to make that mark. So, yeah. So in a way, I, I, I sort of know where I'm going. But it's always a surprise kind of how it ends. <laughs> yeah, Kathy. Well, um, I don't know how many other painters are in the discussion today, but I'm a painter, and so... It's always very exciting for me to hear another painter talk about their process. Mm -hmm. And what I am hearing from you is that um, part of the process is this documentation for you. So it is like a recipe. The recipe tells us step by step. Mm -hmm. 
what comes first, what you blend together, what dry ingredients, et cetera. Mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. And those are done in a purposeful way for us to have an end product that is beautiful, tastes delicious, and hasn't sunk to the bottom of the pan. Right, right. You know? um, and so, so I, I'm just thoroughly enjoying your sh- you know, willingness to share with us about the ways in which you're identifying the different points and steps that mm-hmm. go to the completion. Mm-hmm. And in a way, for me, it seems to explain the process that you engage in. And I think that for a lot of us who are creators or makers, much of what we have as an end product mm-hmm. is certainly fulfilling, but it's been that process mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. been almost most precious and most, um, I don't know, it, yeah, yeah, connected to us. So I am just really glad to be here and to um, learn more about how you go about finding your way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So a couple of questions. So first, is there a map underneath all of the paintings? Not all of them, but I do seem to. Um, so there's trees and maps. So I have. Um, so after I photographed those um, childhood landscape, I did a lot of drawings from the photographs of these trees and vines. They were just. Um, interesting visually, so I did a lot of drawings of those. And then I did Xeroxes of those drawings, really large, because um, I don't mind when the um, Xerox copy is it's all pixelated and broken up. So that's kind of interesting too. Um, so a lot of these have trees, and this is a map of Bangkok. So this way of working allows some of that to, to remain at the final end so the viewer can see it. Um, some get to have the same things in it, but they're, they get buried. In that they're not left visible. But it seems to be like when you're facing the blank canvas, um, having some image there, I find, is a, is a really nice way to have something to respond to. Yeah. Get it. yeah. Um, so do you have a guide to which maps are underneath? Well, you have to select. Is that Manhattan? Is that Columbus Circle? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you bet. Just a comment. When I came in and surrounded by all these red paintings and heard that you lived in Australia, it felt painful. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So do you think a couple thousand years from now, or multiple thousand years, when they find your paintings, <laughs> the archaeologists say, you know, and they're saying, I wonder if this looks layered, and this explores the layers, and they finally end up removing enough painting to find the map, and say, oh, what, what do you think they're going to think at that moment? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if Rand McNally got it. Uh, <laughs> 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 you, you don't have to answer that. No idea. No idea how to answer that. How many layers are there? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I can tell you by when if I look at my book. <laughs> yeah, so it could be up to six to eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I And knowing that this is what I do... <gasps> Then I, I'm, I think the next thing I should do is try to get rid of all of that and see if I could do a painting, if one take, you know, just one take painting, you know, and that, that's kind of an interesting thought to me. Can I, can I, can I do that? You know, because sometimes what happens as a result of photographing your process as you go along, and you years later you kind of start looking at these photographs, you go, wow. I really like that first step, you know? And I'm not so sure it needed six more steps, you know? So that's that's one of the downsides, I think, of maybe look, you know, photographing. But um, but that's that's something I do think about is can I can I get that simple that I could do a one take? What can you tell us or choose one of the paintings? What was what did you think? I don't know if this is the right words. What did you think it was going to look like when you started? 
or what what were you where did you think you were going to go when you started or is that not are you, are you more into the pieces and you let the pieces just create the end mm. so i do think there's okay so thinking i think one thing that really guides the work is materials so it's very based on materiality. I know what each material is going to do. I know the plaster is going to be opaque. I know the ink is going to be transparent. I know the tape is going to create hard edge. I know the, um, the way I paint um, with these fluid golden acrylics is going to have you know, pores and blending. So I understand what the materials are going to do. So then it's about combining you know, how I want them to talk to each other. And I can control that somewhat, but there's a lot of accident that happens too. And um, so, so that's one area of approach is the materials. And then the thinking is, so I knew I wanted to work with this idea of our wounds are not obliterated, but they can become fuel. Like, whoa, like how, how can I try to put that into any pictorial language? So I knew I had that idea and it's kind of like poetry in that you've got the idea and like this one, for example, um, you know, there was some tough stuff going on, you know, in our family. And I, and I knew this color was going to kind of address it. Um, but I didn't know how all the elements were going to work together and how it would ultimately speak, but I knew the language of the materials. So that's about as much as I need to know. And then I trust the process that I, I that somehow I hope, and you can tell me this, you know, you hope somehow that the work, that you can find something to connect to, that there's some way in for you as the viewer to find a connection. And it doesn't have to be my connection. You know, that's, that's important, you know. Um, well, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thank you.